All right, what's up? Okay, yeah, where, where are you now? I am in Dallas. In Dallas, okay, yeah, you'll be play, playing here tomorrow night. Uh, okay, well, we just wanted to ask you a few questions about tomorrow night's show and a few other things. Okay. So, uh, how, how's everything been going for you the last, uh, since almost exactly a year since you were here last? Well, I would say that we've been having a very good time. Whenever, whenever anybody asks me, I always tell them this is the best job in the world. Best job in the world. Right. Compared to what? Well, compared to anything. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, let's see. Since the last time you were here, you put out a couple more albums, including uh, some mail-order albums. Uh, how, how did that experience work out for you? Uh, they've been very profitable. And do you plan on doing any more of that kind of thing in the future? Yes. Uh, any idea of what we can expect? Uh, once the lawsuit with Warner Brothers and my former manager is settled, I will probably be making available all of the early albums mail order and probably another volume of uh, guitar solos uh, sometime next year. Okay. Well, as, as uh, that was something I was going to ask you about, one of the uh, most common questions we get around KPFT is, is about the old Verve albums, and I wanted to ask you about that. Are you planning on reissuing those in the exact same packaging and so forth, or are you going to re-record parts of them, or how are you going to do that? Uh, well, since uh, most of the Verve albums were done four-track with uh, equipment that by today's standards would be described as primitive, I'm going to try and do some things to enhance the sound of them. And they're probably... Uh, the original artwork, the original covers will be used, but there'll probably be different interiors, maybe with the addition of some other, uh, you know, old photographs and things like that. So it's some way to spiff it up a little bit, and I'm probably going to release them in pairs, like Freak Out would be a double, and uh, put Absolutely Free together with uh, Reuben and the Jets, and We're Only In It For The Money and Lumpy Gravy would be another double, and, uh, you know, on like that. Yeah, so w w would you be actually going in and into a studio and re-recording like the bass line or something, or would it just no. be remixing? No, it would probably be remixing, remastering, things like that. I see. Any any idea how soon we can expect that, or do you even Not know? until after the lawsuit is settled. What's the prospects of that being It done? goes to court in December, and I expect that it's going to run for three months, and then uh, whatever the appeals are after that, I have no idea. But uh, that's something that I've had in the back of my mind for quite some time is to bring those albums out again. One thing that I would like to do, though, is on the Freak Out album, the um, piece of Monster Magnet on side four. Well, that is unfinished. They wouldn't let me finish the thing before the album was released, and I expect to be able to, to go back in and put that all together the right way. So we might actually see even more on Freak Out than was there in the first place. Yes, and on a couple of the other albums, there were tunes. You see, in the early days when I was doing albums, the budgets that I was given to do these things uh, were never really enough to do this stuff right. You know, there was never enough time in a studio to fix everything up. Now I have my own studio. And so it's quite possible that in the case of some of the albums, tunes that were left out because they were unfinished could be finished now and added in. And in the case of the Hot Rats album, the original one, I've been thinking about redoing the guitar solos in that. I see. So uh, you, not just the Verve albums, but some of the others you're oh, all, on. I'm talking about the, the whole entire catalog, all 30-some albums, making that all available. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as, as for the, without getting too involved in, in any uh, legal legal matters that you might not be able to talk about, uh, is, is the suit involving those albums, is that uh, basically between you and Warner Brothers or you and MGM, or, or who are the parties involved in that? The parties are Warner Brothers Records, uh, my former manager, Herb Cohen, his brother, an attorney, Martin Cohen, who drew all the contracts. And the suit is, for, uh, is brought for fraud and breach of fiduciary responsibility. I see, and... and uh, how, how does Warner Brothers figure into that in the first place? It was MGM that originally released those. And, uh, yeah, well, the way that that figures in is um, my former manager is claiming 50% ownership of those masters. I see. Okay, well, to get off of um, unpleasant subjects and on to more current things, uh, what is the origin of the name Barking Pumpkin Records? My wife used to have a bad, very bad cough. And uh, that the sound was what you would consider the sound of a barking pumpkin? That's right. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about the new album, the uh, the newest album, I should You say. Are What You Is? Yeah. Well, it has three songs in there dealing with a topic that a lot of people like to ignore, which is the religion industry in America. Yeah. One of the things that's uh, kind of bringing uh, 
the good life to a standstill for the vast majority of people in the United States. Well, are you a, are you an atheist or anti-religious, or, or do you just... Uh... No, I'm, I'm a realist, and the way I feel about the religion industry in the United States is this. You could balance the federal budget a lot quicker by taxing the churches than by chopping down school lunches. Yeah. And uh, I think that the churches in the United States have had a free ride for too long. I believe that they owe taxes going all the way back 200 years. They should, they should pay their own way. This has nothing to do with anybody's belief in uh, Jesus or uh, you know anybody or anything else you want to believe in. But when a guy stands in front of a television camera and promises you a spot in heaven if you send in a certain amount of money, I think that that's going beyond the realms of good taste. And that's basically what they're doing. And they have uh, a lot of uh, support because they're paying off. They own uh, businesses. And uh, these businesses employ people, so certain people want those businesses to succeed, otherwise uh, whole local economies will fail. And there's a lot of vested interest tied up with uh, these religious operations, and they're all getting away tax-free. It's not fair. And you can't find a legislator any place that'll stand up on its hind legs and say, come on, we can straighten things out if we just make these people pay their fair share. And uh, I think that somebody ought to do it. And since they ain't, I'm saying it. Okay, well, uh, an another one of our DJs who uh, was a few minutes late getting here just showed up, so I'll let him pick up the other extension, and he has a few questions to ask, too. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask you, though, uh, uh, on the subject of religion and your songs relating to religion, you uh, had a song called The Meek Shall Inherit Nothing, which is on the new album. That's that, right. that song is, was... Uh, premiered uh, a long time ago on the Saturday Night Live show. Why did it take so long for that song to be released officially? Well, you know, I have a lot of uh, a large backlog of material, and uh, the, the things don't always come out 15 minutes after I write them. Some songs have sat around for years before they finally got onto a record. Mm -hmm. But the situation has existed for years, so there's no reason why the song couldn't exist for years also. Okay. Uh, well, anyway... Uh, uh, as for not quite so recent stuff, the album's Joe's Garage, Acts 1 through 3, uh, you, you seem to have uh, virtually abandoned playing that material on stage. Is there any particular reason for that? Because we're playing songs from Tinseltown Rebellion, from You Are What You Is, um, a couple of regional favorites from um, Overnight Sensation that always seem to be <laughs> popular in this particular area, and also things that haven't been released yet. I see. Can we expect a lot of unreleased material tomorrow? Oh, I would say probably half an hour of the show is dedicated to that kind of material. All right. Got a question, Dick? Oh, sure. How you doing? Hi there, Dick. How you doing? I just rushed in. This is Dick Skits, by the way, here. Dick Skits, all right. Uh, let's see. I've got a list of stuff here to ask you. Uh, oh, have you heard the uh, the Grandmother's album? No. You have well, yeah, I've heard part of it. I heard it over at Jimmy Carl Black's girlfriend's house in Albuquerque. <laughs> I didn't hear the whole thing though. Uh huh. Uh, well, I heard they were going to uh, they were going to go on tour and, and start uh, calling themselves a mother's invention. Well, I believe that if they call themselves a mother's of invention, that they'll be sued because they own that name. Oh yeah, you won't let them use it. No. Yeah. Well, first of all, they're not the mothers of invention. They're merely people who were formerly employed by me in those in that band. Right. And uh, the material that they're playing is not Mothers of Invention material. It's material that's indigenous to the group that they have now. Uh -huh. you know, I think that even calling themselves the Grandmothers is stretching it a little bit. Well, I thought it was kind of strange, but you know, it was a way to sell it, I guess. Don Preston on the telephone just before I left, you know, and he was you know, trying to push for the fact that they wanted to call themselves the Mothers of Invention, and I told them no. Well, good. I'm glad you're not giving up that name. There's no reason why I should. I might want to use it again myself in 15 minutes. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any plans to play with any of those people any time in the near future? No. Okay. Uh, uh, they're entitled to do whatever they want that's their music, you know, but I don't like the idea of other people going on stage and uh, doing my music and not doing it well. And the, the songs of mine that they have played in their show, they do not do well. And they've also done things <laughs> like um, uh, they have a doll that looks like me that they put on stage and make fun of periodically. And <laughs> If, if that's the only thing that they have to offer in the way of entertainment, then that's yeah. not too suave. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I, on uh, other past matters, I've noticed a similarity uh, 
uh, particularly on the on the three new mail order albums, Shut Up and Play Your Guitar, uh, volumes one through three, uh, there's a song on each album called Shut Up and Play Your Guitar. Right. And, and that particular structure of that solo is a solo that seems to have appeared on just about every album you've done since Burnt Weenie Sandwich. Is, is there a particular reason for that? Or, uh, I don't see how you could prove that. Uh, well, I, I, like that. I don't mean to prove it. I just yeah, there are other people who disagree with him. Yeah, it, it just uh, I've noticed a bit of a similarity, and I wonder if that was a conscious thing on your part, or if it was just uh, maybe my imagination. I think your imagination is probably running overtime. The only thing that that might have in common with other solos on other albums is the key that it's in. Yeah, yeah. which is C. Lydian. Which reminds me, you have uh, offers for sheet music and, and things like that. Are you going to have um, some sheet music for any of the older stuff? Um, like the orchestrated pieces there? Oh, yes. That's all being prepared. That's oh, right. that's uh, great. Um, I was trying to get all that ready before I left L.A. on this tour, and I couldn't. I had to send out postcards to all the people that sent in, and we've had you know, thousands of uh, inquiries about the sheet music. But uh, I didn't have a chance to finished the preparation for lithographing on all the stuff before uh, I left, so that's going to have to wait until the end of the tour. Is this the uh, then the beginnings of your, uh, your sort of school, a sort of way to get uh, other people to uh, to get into this? Well, one thing that happens every year when we hold auditions is a lot of people come in and, um, and try out, and they find out that they just literally can't read what's stuck in front of them. Right. And then they ask for pieces of music they can take home and practice. And uh, this is going to expedite those matters quite a bit because uh, if you have any aspirations about playing in the band or, or just want to improve your uh, technique, looking at this music and practicing it has got to have uh, a good effect. Yeah. Because it's it's hard. It's hard stuff. Oh, it really is. I've been uh, I've been messing with the guitar for quite a while, and I I, I can't come anywhere near it. Well, speaking of people playing in the band, how, how would someone who wanted to be in, in Frank Zappa's band go about uh, being in Frank Zappa's band at this point? You send a resume, which includes all of your training and experience. I'm not so uh, worried about what conservatory you went to or anything, but, uh, you know, how many tours you've done, what kind of, uh, how long you've been playing, and reading music is totally important, and I'm talking about sight reading hard stuff on the spot. If you can't do it, don't send it. Don't send the, the resume. And send a cassette of uh, the way you play. And when somebody leaves the group, then my secretary gets out the files and I start calling people up. Well, along that regard, who is in the band now? The last time you were here... Uh... Well, we have three new guys. And All right. We have a drummer named Chad Wackerman who tried <laughs> out uh, over 40 guys. He got the job uh, after hearing about 40 drummers. And uh, he's 21 years old. He's only been on the road once before, and that was with Leslie Uggams doing dinner theaters. And he's been <laughs> playing since he was seven, and he's real good. And we have a bass player named Scott Tunis, who uh, I don't know where he went to school, but he's been working with a punk band in San Francisco called the Ready Maids. But in his spare time, uh, he was uh, listening to classical music and studying Elliot Carter and stuff like that, you know, he reads and he's real good, has good showmanship and uh, sings a little bit. He got the job over 25 bass players. And the second keyboard player is Bobby Martin. He was on the road with Etta James for three years and before that with Eric Burden. He plays uh, French horn, tenor sax, keyboards, and sings real good. Those are the three new guys. And as far as the old guys go, Steve Vai is still in the band, Master of Stratocaster Abuse, Ray White on uh, guitar and vocals, and uh, Tommy Mars on keyboards, and Ed Mann on percussion. Very good. So it's an eight-piece group. Why have you gone to uh, having bigger bands on stage lately? You know, like because we're doing a more orchestral kind of a sound. You'll find out that you come to the show, you'll see that this eight-piece band at some moment sounds just like a symphony orchestra. Yeah, you did a bit in the last uh, the last tour here, uh, I guess it was last year, that right in the big, right in the middle you had uh, an orchestrated piece that really, uh, I went away <laughs> just wanting to get a hold of something like that by you, you know, it just, oh, that, piece that was, was delicious. That, that's the middle part of uh, Easy Mead, yeah. that's on Tinseltown Rebellion. 
Yeah, that's something I wanted to ask you about. The last time you were here in Houston, uh, when you came to our station, you, you played the uh, the album Crush All Boxes in its entirety, of which uh, Easy Meat was one of the cuts included on that album. Well, as it turned out, parts of that showed up on the last album, and parts of it showed up on this album, and Easy Meat was an entirely different version from the one you played that night. Uh, that's right. What, what, why was, uh, what was the reason for all the differences in the... Well, I decided to change my mind. <laughs> And what happened to the name Crush All Boxes? Oh, it'll never be used. Yeah. So I, I heard uh, I heard some juicy rumors. You must love that. Um, do you really have a, a basement-type work room that you spend a lot of time in, or do you have a studio separate? Or? I used to, and now I have a studio next door to my house. Very good. So uh, what I heard about that was that you spent a lot of time in there, uh, very little time at home with the uh, with the folks. Well, it is my home. Yeah. I, the kids come in the studio, and it's not like uh, I'm a stranger to my family. Uh-huh. It's all, it's all connected. So you're just a regular daddy kind of guy? I'm a daddy kind of a guy, except that I work 18 hours a day at home. Uh-huh. 18 hours? Yep. Every day? Well, some days only 16. What do you do in all that time? Uh, a lot of different things. Have you ever made an album? No, I can't say that I have. Well, it takes a long time to uh, tweeze everything up. And uh, last, uh, between the time the tour finished last year, which was about the 12th or 14th of December, and uh, the time that this one started, which was uh, the middle of September, I did, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, ten, twelve sides. That's a lot of work. Yeah. Besides that, I produced a... Uh, video on um, the title song from You Are What You Is. I managed to write two new orchestral pieces. I wrote uh, a couple of uh, magazine articles. For what magazines? Um, there's one that was, has appeared in High Times, and there's another one that appeared in Musician. And uh, I also answered a lot of fan mail, personally, by hand. So I have quite a bit of work that I do when I'm home. Well, uh, allowing for the possibility that you're going to get an awful lot of letters from Houston now, what percentage of your fan mail do you answer? Um, I would say 50%, maybe better. Great. And the only thing that, um, that slows it down is the amount of spare time that I have to do it because so much of it came in and I hired a secretary, and what I do is I dictate the letters. She types them up, and then I sign them. And uh, before I left on, on this tour, I took a whole day. I'm, I'm talking about like eight hours, and they answered uh, all the mail that had stacked up <clears throat> before I had a chance to answer it. She typed the stuff up, then sent a whole box of uh, uh, finished typed work to Las Vegas, which I then signed in the hotel that night after the show. And then it was all mailed out from Las Vegas uh, right after that. And we get letters from all over the place. You wouldn't believe it. We get them from prisons. We get them from uh, countries all over the world. We get them from kids 10 years old who send me pictures that they've drawn of me. It's, it's really a weird assortment of mail. What kind of letters do you mo most like to get, uh, if In there is any? Intelligent any. ones. Intelligent. <laughs> okay. You were speaking about uh, the video. I haven't had even a chance to... Uh See baby snakes. I don't believe it's it's been shown here. It hasn't been there. I think it's been in Dallas, but it hasn't been in Houston. Is, is there any other video that you have? Like I heard, you know, you have uh, you are what you is. Uh, the you are, you are what you is video is only four minutes long. But uh -huh. um, for those of you who uh, I don't know whether they have MTV cable in that area, you know what that is. Mm -hmm. It stands for music television. Cable is at a uh, very uh, all time low. miserable point here in Houston. It's practically oh. no penetration. Gee, too bad because politics. On Halloween night, uh, we're doing a live satellite broadcast in stereo from the Palladium in New York City. Mm -hmm. Well, a grand total of about five Houstonians will be able to see that, I think. Great. Well, they'll enjoy it, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, uh, back to Baby Snakes. What is the problems with the distribution, and why have we not been able to see that? Because the way I've been distributing it is through uh, rock and roll promoters. Normal motion picture distributors won't touch it because it doesn't have any uh, stars in it or car chases <laughs> or any of the things that normal people really enjoy. Is that like your TV special? I heard you had a TV special that was turned down. Yeah. You know, 
know, they like to see Elton John dancing with Cher. Uh huh. You know, that's their idea of real entertainment. Yeah. Or Donnie and Marie and the Flavor Crystals. Right. How typical. Yeah, they've totally ruined Saturday morning. I've got a, a young daughter who I'm, I'm really fearful of what she has to look forward to. Well, you have a point there. <laughs> I think about hiding the TV set. I think that that's probably a good idea. Well, whatever became of the Zappa Records label? That was a contract with Phonogram, which expired. And so Marking Pumpkin is uh, the new name, and it's not distributed by Phonogram. It's distributed by CBS. Are there any plans to have any other artists on the on the Barking Pumpkin label? No. Okay, on, on Zappa Records, you had one album by El Shankar. Uh, are you still working with him or any future releases? I'm in touch with him, but uh, I have, uh, I'm not doing any other producing. I don't have time, and I don't really enjoy it, so I'm not stressing that part of my career. Speaking of production, I always wanted to have, find out, what was the story behind you producing an album for Grand Funk Railroad? They called me up and asked me if I wanted to do it, and so I thought, well, it'd be funny if I did it. And I went to uh, Michigan <laughs> to their studio and listened to their material, and I liked it, and I decided to do it. Are you satisfied with it? As far as the production on it? Yeah, well, everything in general. Well, I think that it would have been a more successful album if they hadn't have broken up as soon as the album was finished. As a matter of fact, they broke up while it was being recorded. There was a bunch of arguments between the three guys uh, versus Sparner, and... Uh, I had to talk him into finishing the vocals on the thing. And as soon as, as soon as the album was done, they were supposed to do a tour, but then they broke up, and you know, the album was never heard of again. It's got a couple of really good songs on it. They're trying to make a comeback now, I believe. They asked me to produce their new album, but I refused to do it. <laughs> do you have any, any uh, interest or desire to work with other name artists, so-called, and not, not just as a producer, but as a collaborator? No. About that movie you were going to, uh, you were going to come out with, with I believe it was Barbara Streisand. Oh, I mean Hunch and Toot. Yeah. I still haven't been able to to talk with her, and uh, I doubt whether or not that she's going to opt to do it. The script is still available, and uh, I've tried uh, to interest a few other people in working on it, but uh, so far no results. So any reason why you're on the blacklist for some reason here? In the well, you know, sometimes uh, people just don't want to hear the truth, and they don't want to hear the facts, and they would rather just exist in a little dream bubble. Well, you and can sometimes what I say disturbs some people. Yeah, you can pretty much say the name Frank Zappa, and a lot of people go ooh ah e and run away. That's right. Well, can't help it. That's the best rep to have, I guess. <laughs> it's better than having a flavor crystal rep. That's for sure. <laughs> Well, uh, on a similar subject, why is it that all your songs tend to have a, a almost cynical message to them? Is there any... Well, what's wrong with being cynical? I'm Nothing wrong with it, but it just... Uh, you I'll know. give you an example of somebody who's not cynical. Donnie and Marie, they're not cynical. Do you like that? <laughs> I mean, cynical is the only way to be. Come on, you can't just be swallowing the entire 20th century whole. You, know, you just can't do it. It's being realistic. Well, do you ever have a desire to write uh, a love song about life at home with your wife and kids or anything? That's nobody's business but my own. You know, I've, I've always uh, felt a great amount of disgust for people who go around featuring their personal hurt. I just don't think that that's uh, ethical to, to earn your living by telling people what's going on inside of your own poor, tragic little lifestyle. What about your personal joy with the family? That's nobody's business either, you know. Besides, the, the, the stuff that I do at home and the way I relate to uh, my family is not something for uh, public consumption. That's my family. You know, I'm not going to go out and earn a living off of my family. Uh -huh. Well, you know, it's, it's just like the uh, the fan magazines, and I guess we are asking you a lot of fan-type questions that you probably get real tired of. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, people really are interested in, in folks who are in the news, their life, and and how they handle all this stuff, you know? It's just... Yeah, well, I handle it okay. <laughs> you must. On the uh, Tinseltown Rebellion album, down at the very bottom in the fine print, you had a, a real strongly worded statement addressed to critics uh, concerning quoting of lyrics and that type of thing. What was the reason behind that? Because uh, after 16 years in the business and having been misquoted by uh, print media consistently and thoroughly and maliciously, I decided that there was uh, come a time to do something to keep them from taking my lyrics and using them in articles that they write to uh, illustrate points that are not uh, um, germane to the subject. 
Uh, well, after, after that album was released, I did see uh, snippets of the lyrics to that in, in print, and I wondered if it was that action. Send them to me, and I'll tell you whether or not uh, I'm going to sue those people. I see. So you, you uh, if, if indeed you did see uh, snippets of those, you would take action against them? Unless they have permission to use them. Uh, it's my right to either charge them money to put that into print or refuse them permission, because I own the copyright on those lyrics. There's no reason why I should have somebody using my own lyrics against me in print. Mm -hmm. Do you strongly object to bad reviews or just to... to I strongly object to um, the motivation for the way in which I'm portrayed in print media. And how do you, how do you think you're portrayed in print media? I'm usually portrayed as uh, something bad, something negative, or something uh, crazy, or something wrong, or, you know usually in a very negative way and the way I look at it I'm I should be uh, an endangered species in America but I should be subject to uh, you know some sort of environmental protection because I'm doing a job that very few people would opt to do I'm taking the time to say the stuff that needs to be said saying it in a plain and simple way and providing an element of common sense in the middle of uh, a bunch of stuff that is really quite confusing and uh, quite disturbing but there are people who don't want to hear that you know it, it bothers them because uh, they would rather sit there and keep their mouth shut and hope that it all goes away do you get much flack from uh, religious groups like such as the moral majority and that that type of thing I about never me? heard any comment from any fundamentalist organization i have been informed though that i've been misquoted in fundamentalist pamphlets but nobody from any fundamentalist organization has ever contacted me or my office. Even, I, even after doing the Meek Show at Hair Nothing on national TV? Absolutely. The only contact I've ever had with any religious organization, and it wasn't really a religious organization, that's the Anti-Defamation League. That's a PR organization that's connected with uh, the Jewish faith. And that was for Jewish princes. That was for Jewish princes, yeah. you know, and even that was unfounded because uh, they, they went beyond the realms of good taste in accusing me of being anti-Semitic, which is, which is totally untrue. And uh, I think that they just capitalized on the song in order to get the name of their organization in print. But there was no lawsuit involving that. There was nothing. It was just a bunch of PR uh, frog wash in the news and uh, ultimately led to nothing. I've had no comments from any Catholic organization, no comments from any fundamentalist or Buddhist, Muslim, uh, any other nothing. You know, they, they don't talk to me. And there's one good reason why because I'm right. And if they ever had to debate me, they're going to wind up on the wrong end of the stick because as far as I'm concerned, what the fundamentalists are doing in the United States right now is carefully overlooking one little part of the Bible. And that's the part where Jesus threw the money changers out of the temple. And that's exactly what they're doing right now. They're changing money in the temple. And if Jesus was here today, he would put on the big boot and he would get those suckers off television because the only thing they're doing is making money and they're not doing anything really to help uh, any kind of a Christian movement. It's totally self-aggrandizement for a bunch of smiling idiots with suits on, sitting there trying to pretend that they're holy, and they're also telling one of the large lies of the century, one, that they are the majority, and the other large lie of the century is that they are moral. They are neither. Hallelujah. Why do you suppose these people are growing in popularity to the extent that they are today? I don't think that they are growing in popularity. I think what they're doing is controlling the media image of their size and their strength so that, that the average guy who says nothing and who sits there and waits for the world to go by just believes it. If all he ever hears is majority, 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 that's a word that makes him think that there is more than 50% of them and there are not more than 50% of them. Remember, the president we have right now, when he goes on television and talks about the mandate handed to him by the American people, his mandate came from 17% of the electorate. That's all that went to the polls that last time. 17% of the Americans elected that guy. That's not the majority. That just means that everybody stayed home because they didn't want to have to choose between that cracker from Georgia or the cowboy from California. You know, that's no choice at all. And out of the 17% that did go to the poll, they were well organized and they were organized by those religious fanatic fringe groups. And the thing that's smart about what those religious groups have done is they've invested so heavily in television apparatus. They have their own stations, they have their own satellite access. 
And uh, they do a lot of people really watch those things? Of course they do. I watch them. I watch them all the time. I know what they're doing. I've seen them on there saying things that you wouldn't believe. You want to hear a classic example of something I actually saw on television sure. in L.A.? I saw a woman with uh, tears in her eyes standing next to her uh, assistant or husband or whoever it was with one of those uh, nice chewing gum shaped hairdos, you know, molded skull cap kind of helmet hair, <laughs> you know, nothing out of place. And she's weeping and they're talking about the Holy Beamer. The Holy Beamer is their new satellite they're raising money for. And here's the pitch. If you're a shut-in and you're at home, if you send in the money, and we put up the Holy Beamer. When Jesus comes again, you won't miss it because maybe the major networks won't carry it, but you'll see it on this station. Now, how do you like that? Now, what does that say to a person sitting at home in a wheelchair who loves Jesus and doesn't want to miss it when he comes back to earth again? You have to send in money to the Holy Beamer. It's your last chance. You know, you can't get out of the house fast enough to wave at him when he shows up. <laughs> And you know that if you watch NBC, it's going to be nothing but the flavor crystals. <laughs> I saw another guy. It was Jimmy Swaggart. I saw him stand in front of a television camera with a model of an office building and ask for contributions of $10,000. He wants you to send in $10,000 to help finance one little cubicle in this office building. And what do you get for it? You get a brass plaque with your name on it that goes on the wall in that office. And he said this. He said, and it'll be there until Jesus comes. Which means that when he comes to visit Jimmy Swaggart's office and sees your name on the wall, he'll know who to go to for a good time. Now, to stand in front of a camera while people are trying to figure out how they're going to get something to eat and say, send me $10,000 for a brass plaque. And this ain't funny anymore. Well, there's an old saying that says uh, a fool deserves to be parted from his money. Don't you think that, that uh, to some extent those people are bringing this on themselves? Well, here's one of my theories. Science tells us that the most plentiful substance in the universe is hydrogen. I disagree. The most plentiful substance in the universe is stupidity. <laughs> okay, but whether or not we deserve to be composed of hydrogen and stupidity is uh, something for very deep philosophical debate, you know. I, I don't like the idea of people who are badly equipped to deal with logic being victimized by somebody who tricks them. You know, you're talking about there's a sucker born every minute kind of mentality, and as long as you're only out to ream the people who, who are um, not a, as well equipped as you are to deal with the real world, that's not fair. Well, what uh, what kind of action would you recommend, or, or do you even have any any ideas to what what should be done? I mean, yes, I, I have a very good idea. They should be taxed. The thing, the reason why they can flourish so much is they don't pay any taxes. They have multi-million dollar businesses, and they're not churches; they're businesses. They take money, they reinvest it mostly in real estate, other companies, other stocks. They have influence throughout the United States, and because it's church owned, they're not taxed. They're getting a free ride. I believe it, that the Christian church is the largest uh, the largest corporation in the world. Well, there's a number of very large corporations in the world. The Catholic church ain't too tiny either, you know? And when you look at the... You, you want to carry this to the ridiculous extreme is look at what happens in Iran when you have a country that is run by religion. They can put a 12-year-old kid in front of a firing squad there because he doesn't believe what the Koran says or says anything that the government doesn't like. Now, I don't want to see that happening around here, but you let religious fundamentalists go the whole route, and that's what you're going to get. The bottom line is, the churches should be taxed. They're in business, and they're making a profit. And they should pay taxes like everybody else. And when they do, you will see a balanced budget, because they, I think that they owe for the last 200 years. And somebody should go after them and say, come on. Let's see some bucks here and stop messing with the school lunches. Well, there's a lot of people who would say that, that, that religion in America does do a lot of good in terms of helping the poor and that kind of thing, and, and they might take issue with that. that yeah, way well, of let's, well, let's examine that. When you say a lot of good, all right, when you take any kind of fundraising situation, 
the bulk of the money always goes to the organization. The smallest part of it goes to the, the needy who are supposed to be helped with a thing. That's if right. you want to help the poor, you can do more good by going out, getting a box of groceries, and going down to the worst part of town and just setting the box of groceries on the street and match your donation. Or giving away some clothes, but by the time you send it to an organization, they have their clerical staff, their executive staff, their middle management, their PR budget, their airtime, all the rest of that stuff that they have to spend money to, to build up this hype. And that's where the money goes. It goes to all those paper handling salaries. It doesn't go to the people that, you, that need to be helped. I mean, if you've got a, a soft spot in your heart for uh, the underprivileged, then do something directly. Well, do you, uh, do you have uh, any inherent objection to organized religion, or is it just the, the commercialization of it that you don't, uh, don't particularly agree with? The thing that I object to is when any organization, whether it's business, whether it's government, whether it's religion, whether it's uh, a lodge hall or some kind of a social thing, whatever it is, when they, when they exert more influence than they are entitled to, on the lives of people who do not wish to participate, that is not democracy, it's not fair, doesn't belong, it doesn't say so in the Constitution, it should be done away with, and let's have some freedom around here. Freedom not to be abused by somebody's minority uh, organization. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, on another subject, uh, on the tour program for the 1980 tour, which we managed to get a few of here. Uh, there was a song, the lyrics to a song called We're Turning Again, which doesn't seem to have appeared on any record. Is there any chance that we may hear that anytime soon, like maybe tomorrow night? Absolutely. Guarantee you'll hear it. We're Turning Again? Yep. Great, great. Uh, and it will be on an album anytime soon? Probably on the next one. That sounds good. Do you have a plan for a name for that? Um, yeah, I have a name, but I'm not going to tell you yet. Okay, is it going to be a single or a double album? I don't know. Probably a double. Predominantly live again? Probably going to be done like Shake Your Booty, live basics with overdubs. And that seems to be a formula that you've gotten very attached to lately. What's I like it. Yeah, it sounds good. Is it just uh, easier than going into a studio and starting from scratch? Or, or oh, it's way easier because um, before this tour, I not only bought a brand new PA system, uh, but I also bought a recording truck, which has two 24-track machines in it, and... Uh, you know, 100 inputs and a lot of outboard gear. Most of the stuff from my home studio is now in that truck. It's got video equipment and everything. So we've been recording all of these shows. So you really do record every show you do? Yes. Yeah, I noticed last year you did a video. Yep. Whatever happens to all the tapes of all these shows you've ever done? I have a vault. <laughs> is there any, any uh, possibility that things of that will be released like on a mail order basis or something over the years if I get the mail order business more established yes so you're really planning on making that a, a regular sideline well I have to because uh, with the problems that I have getting airplay and the problems of uh, getting accurate exposure in print media and so forth but the only way that uh, I can get what I do directly to the people who want to hear it with uh, as little interference as possible is to do it mail order why do you suppose you have so much trouble getting airplay? Oh, because uh, I'm the way I am. <laughs> and because they're the way they are. <laughs> what do you think is the biggest misconception about Frank Zappa? Um, I don't know. I have no idea. Whatever it is. They have ten legs and horns. And <laughs> Okay, well, thanks a lot, Frank. We really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to us and uh, look forward to seeing the show tomorrow night. Okay, Doug. All right, thank you. Ciao, mate.